Okay, Kariti, it's your show. Uh, okay, so before before I I show you the demo, I think uh, the when we talk about this topic last week, um, I I feel that we were struggling uh, in two pos in two different positions that were somehow related but were not well defined. So spend time trying to think about this problem space and trying to um, define the different features that I believe are needed via the evaluator when it comes to a, a module graph. Um, I, I believe there are three related features that, that will be needed. Um, some of them are possible to, to be solved today. Um, some of them are not. The three features that I believe are important uh, are the first one is if I'm importing a module, um, how can I control uh, how to resolve the, the source that that this module that I'm importing represents. It's basically what the what, what you could achieve today with the import maps. So if I have a import map that describe when this module try to import this module specifier, this is where you can locate it. Sort of right, the, okay. the mapping of that. Good. And and um, and as I said, in this particular case for browsers, there is a solution. For Node, there is no solution. And obviously, for the evaluator, we should have a way to uh, uh, hook into that process in a way that we could act as a resolver of some sort. Um, that's just defining what kind of relationship there is between the importer and the import team in terms of resolution. Um, the second problem to solve is um, you already know the URL of the thing. You already um, know that you're what? I'm sorry, the, I missed the, the word. The URL or the- Oh, the, the URL, the, okay. The, yeah. Let's say it's not, in the, in node is not a URL, but you already know the location where you can locate the file. And, and now you're about to, um, you should be able to go and control the evaluation of that source in some degree where you can decide in which um, in which uh, realm you want to evaluate that, in which compartment you want to evaluate that. I haven't think too much about that in particular because I believe that's that's the easiest one. And and what what this really provides is just uh, in my mind this is just the 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 solution that we're trying to look with the uh, with the parser where we have the ability to parse code and somehow create instances of that module and such. So I believe that's just saying this source goes to this particular realm because the parse is per realm and you will parse it and you will be able to create uh, instances of this module. I, I feel that that's something that we will explore more but I'm not super concerned about. That's okay. the second. Should, should I, should I, um, uh, is it significant that you're saying realm instead of compartment or should I ignore that? For it's now? not, it's not, uh, it, might, it might very well be compartment. Okay. Um, and then the last one, which is the one that I was trying to explain uh, last week is the ability for us to control what, uh, what this module is accessing from the outside world. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel that that's the one that was missing from the, from the, uh, from both proposals, the, 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 the proposal that you present and the, the notes that I show last week. I believe those, are in, 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 I believe that feature in general is missing from there. Um, and the way we are achieving that, uh, the, uh, is by transpilation today, but tomorrow we might want to have a built-in feature that allows to control uh, 
the binding resolutions when evaluating some module. And, and the reason why I believe this is important is because in many cases, you want to um, evaluate a module and, uh, and apply certain rules to what this module is capable to do. And if we say that the, the rules are defined at the compartment level, so you can create a compartment for it and evaluate it into a compartment, I do believe that that's not sufficient because the compartment is sharing intrinsics with a bunch of other people unless it, those are um, frozen, then you have issues with it and such. So the, the compartment for me is not a sufficient encapsulation to feel comfortable saying, oh, you want to just contain something that the module is trying to do, um, just throw a compartment at it. So there's, um, uh, so it's not that compartments uh, mean that we don't have realms anymore. Um, uh, obviously, if you want a different set of intrinsics, uh, that's what the realms proposal is about. But within a given set of intrinsics, uh, sharing a given set of intrinsics, you still need to be able to create separate compartments with separate globals, with separate import namespaces, et cetera. So, um, uh, so the the compartment is by itself is not sufficient to create distinct distinct intrinsics. Uh, to create distinct intrinsics, you still need realms, but the compartment uh, is necessary in order to uh, separate within a realm. Hello. Hello, can, can you hear me? I can hear you now. I Would lost you, you for 30 seconds or so. Okay, um, I, 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 well, there was actually, there was a long silence when I finished uh, talking. Um, uh, I just said that uh, the compartment is necessary to separate within a realm, but realms are still necessary in order to have distinct sets of intrinsics. So they're, they're, um, so if you want to, um, uh, to take a, a module and instantiate it with different sets of intrinsics, then obviously you still need realms to create different sets of intrinsics. But for example, uh, inside a JavaScript environment where we do not expect to have multiple realms, like the embedded space, um, and uh, right now, uh, also like um, uh, browser workers do not have an ability to create multiple realms. There's no iframes in workers. And for the things that we're interested in doing with workers and the things that, things that MetaMask is interested in doing with workers, uh, being able to create a CES worker with multiple compartments would give us everything we need. There's no reason to make a worker capable to have multiple realms within the worker. Uh, the main thing though is the embedded case where it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a memory cost that's just completely unneeded since they're already doing the SAS machine. Yeah, maybe we can do the exercise of, if I need a, a full isolation of one module because it's coming from NPM, let's say I'm pulling a, a module for NPM. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, that's the only module that I use for NPM and I wanted to protect my code from that particular module. Um, okay. And, and I'm, and, and in, in that case, I'll, I'll be able to create a new realm and I will be able to get that module to be evaluated inside that realm and somehow get access to the things that it, it, is, it is exporting and somehow um, uh, controlling those, uh, those things that are exported by that particular module. And this so is where you, things get a little bit more complicated because first, how can I write a component or a module in, in, in my application that imports from that untrusted NPM package? And when I do so, uh, unless that I add a, 
extra indirection of some sort, uh, I will be effectively accessing the, the, the code that is running in a different realm, in a different compartment inside that realm, maybe even. And, mm -hmm. and, and now I have a direct access to that thing that is on trust, that is not trusted. So there's no, it, there's no way for me to introduce a membrane in between these two sides. Well, there, I mean, there is, depending on what controls uh, we provide over the, um, uh, the, the remapping of the import namespace. Uh, so the, uh, in the case of, um, so it wouldn't quite be the, the uh, it wouldn't, it would have to have additional mechanism beyond the membranes as we've talked about. It. Uh, we've talked about uh, how for a given module, you can create an attenuating module yeah. that that re that imports and re-exports the contents of that module. So you can think of that as a sort of module level extension of the main of the membrane concept. Um, the, right, but, but that doesn't that doesn't the attenuated module does not have like bindings anymore because you there's no way you can describe you're getting something from the untrusted source, wrap it into a membrane and export it to you. What happened when that or you know untrusted changes the uh, the the export value? You don't have a sign off for that, and therefore you don't have a way to re-export that. So you we're missing semantics of the module system with the okay. attenuated module in between. Okay, that's a good point. Um, we do, we, there is the module namespace object. Um, uh, right now, the, there's no generic way to say, uh, 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 I want to re I want to export this object as my module namespace object. So if you, you can import a module namespace object from another module, but if you then wrap it in a proxy, um, you can't take a proxy for a module namespace object and export it as your own module namespace object. Uh, if you could, uh, that would be a generic mechanism uh, for, um, I, uh, I don't think so, because the way the module system works is that it, it actually creates a binding from module, oh, important yeah. module uh, environment record to the source module environment record. Is a direct binding there? So as far as I can tell, the direct binding is um, uh, the semantics of a, um, oh, there's the cyclic initialization. Uh, okay, there's probably, you're probably right that there's a hard problem with regard to live bindings. Uh, the, um, the live binding does, once, once things are initialized, once things are linked together and initialized, the live binding really does act like a getter. Um, uh, where um, uh, it, it's, it's as if the module namespace object has a getter property that uh, whenever access just gets the current value of the variable. Um, so by exporting the variable, what you're really doing is you're, is you're exporting a getter that will repeatedly get the variable. Uh, uh, so, uh, that, and that of course will work through a proxy just fine uh, with regard to the initialization logic, I don't know. Right. So the the uh, the uh, my uh, problem number three is really about this particular aspect of it, and I believe the solution for that is to uh, very similar solution to what we describe as the contour or the controls of the contour, I believe we could do a generic solution that allows to uh, per module specify uh, a set of hooks that uh, allows to control 
the resolution of the binding um, in the module body. And if we have that, then uh, the, the, the evaluator should be able to, 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 to describe or to provide a, a, those hook, such hooks that when a module body is being evaluated and a binding is going to be accessed, uh, we have the controls to find the right binding and return it to you whether that's a proxy of it or the real thing or prevent access to it and so and so on um, and i believe that uh so, the, such so that yeah that's a, that's the way the um the agoric translator um uh that um uh, that uh, now uh, michael fig and jf and i have all worked on that's the way the uh the translator translates live bindings is by turning them into a fault on the proxy given to us by the eight magic lines of code and then using the proxy fault on assignment so that you don't have to rewrite the assignment um, so what you're saying it sort of resembles that um, uh, the it seems like a very heavy hammer um, but until but obviously it's it's until we have another known solution i don't know that it's uh too heavy um could you could we walk through the initialization problem because because post initialization mm -hmm. none of this is necessary okay um, initialization um, um so I, I, oh, uh, sorry about that can i ask a question about live bindings um sure. in, in this context so um, the only problem I found with, uh, are, are, are we talking about with scoped bindings at this point? With what bindings? I missed the word. Like, uh, with scope, like like object context, um, you know. Uh, with... so, so the Agoric translation that's trying to you know, emulate a module system on top of the with on a proxy trick. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 so that's using the with on a proxy scoped bindings in order to emulate live bindings. Yes. Uh, but we're with regard to what we're trying to propose, we want to propose something that that is not using a with at oh, all. That, it's just yeah. We, we, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because the pitfall here obviously is is a is a, an enclosed let or const or even var of the same binding name in the code, right? If that will be the spec, right? So so I, I think the eval in module bodies runs into this problem where you cannot have declarations um, that actually will um, end up being top level um, declarations in the module body because they use that approach. Um, so, so really the spec is missing the live bindings um, you know, a, a way to define life bindings um, relative to any scope. So what I'm still trying to understand is um, if a live binding were represented on the namespace object mm -hmm. as an accessor property with a getter and no setter, yeah. and importing from a namespace object uh, created a, you know, that, that's where, you know, the, the import, the import has to do something special. Um, uh, well, well, uh, already so, has to do something so special import, to create a variable that represents somebody else's live binding. It yeah. seems like you could do the same thing to create a local variable that represented a, um, a, a getter that was obtained such that whenever you read the variable, you are really invoking the getter. And yeah. when you try to assign the variable, you got an error. So the, from what I remember, uh, the namespace object is not even create uh, when it comes to evaluating modules or depend, dependency between modules because those dependencies are resolved directly to the environment, environment record of each of, of the modules. The yeah. namespace is only used if you are accessing the namespace object by importing a namespace object. 
um, is not used as a linkage between modules at all. And it is a syntax error, um, not 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 a not a like it is a syntax error to have a var let or const that clashes at the top at the top level of a module with an import. So so you know the safeguard here is that the throw happens with the with the source text. Um, so so in order for you to do that dynamically. Um, the language has to offer a, um, you know, a immutable, uh, almost constant-like uh, declaration that is uh, that is uh, controlled from elsewhere. It doesn't have that. So. I, I didn't quite get what you. So I, I don't think we're proposing changing any of the dynamics of how things work today. So the parser will still parse, and the parser yeah. will still give you the same error saying you have a let declaration yep. for a binding that you are also importing and it will give you the same error it's only when um, the, uh, the the code that is being evaluated inside the module is attempting to access the the binding called foo or is using foo and it needs to be resolved when this process of resolving foo is going to happen but we we might have a way to hook into that process by saying, okay, you're trying to find a binding for foo. Um, uh, this binding is actually something that we're importing for another module, and therefore we'll be able to give you a proxy of it, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So I I was just uh, contrasting from experimenting with the with approach. Um, so with the with approach. The, the problem that I could not get the with closure to to um, to faithfully patch without actually um, um, you know analyzing the text that will be evaluated or that will be inside the with uh, was when 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 a scope declaration conflicted with um, with the binding that is on the proxy of the object context itself for that with closure. Um, so, so I think I think you know we're get, we're getting at the two different sides of of, of this. We're, we're we're not necessarily um, arguing on the same um, side of a problem. Um, yeah, by the way, I, 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 uh, we don't use the with anymore. We use uh, something different, and uh, the problem that you describe is not a problem in that case. Wait, you you. You don't use the width. I don't to... use the width anymore. Yeah, uh, I'll show you today. I'll show you. Oh, today. oh because you because you're rewriting all your code. Yeah, yeah. I'm rewriting the code. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you're you referring rewriting, to the, the rewriting. Just, if you're just, re to, just to be clear, the rewriting is is uh, a re is a rewrite to impose the semantics of what we're talking about now. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The, Binding by subjugation, mode. right? By subjugation, you're putting all your stuff on an object, basically. Mm, no, to, to, but no? I'll, I'll show you the transpilation. But the, <laughs> okay. the point is, the point is, you're going to access a binding, and we will uh, be able to introspect through the process of resolving that thing that you're trying to access. To. Right. I mean, obviously, anything you can do with the width, you can do by a, a rewrite. Mm -hmm. um, yep. You know, the Turing universality is basically by rewrite, you can do anything. Um, the uh, you still don't just to ch just checking uh, with the current ECMAScript, you still don't know of any way to do this with uh, without rewriting and without a width. That it's a choice between one or the other. Correct. I think I think that's correct. Yes. Okay. And, uh, and the more I think about this, I believe that there might be a generic way for us to um, even control the, the access to bindings, even without having to create a new global object, which is even more interesting. Um, but that's uh, that's to be to be debated. 
Okay. Uh, can you say a little bit more about what you have in mind? Uh, no, I, I feel that the, the only reason why you will create a compartment that creates a global object uh, is to, uh, to, to control access to the, uh, the bindings that you have as a global references. Yeah. And, and if, if, if you have a generic way to control that resolution process, then you don't necessarily have to create a global object as it is today specified in, the, in, in 262 as a global object. And in general, you can just uh, use the hook to do the resolution and not having to have a real global object be created. Okay, the, 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 um, uh, in the spec, there's the uh, global environment as well as the global object. And the global environment is exactly for resolving the variables. You're thinking of more directly hooking into the global environment resolution mechanism. Yes. Yep. Okay. I, I feel that that might be easier than convincing people that we might have multiple globals associated to a ROM of some sort, and, uh, and it might, might be a little bit more tricky. Okay, um, the, uh, it'll, I mean, it'll be interesting to talk to implementers and see what they think, but uh, from, the previ from previous history of all of this effort, um, it was pretty much the other way around. The early proposal back when Dave Herman was involved was that rather, th was that uh, you could provide a, uh, essentially a proxy handler and then it would create essentially the equivalent of the proxy as a global object, meaning that the variable references would fault onto the handler, yes. which is pretty pretty much what we're doing with the eight magic lines. Yeah. Um, and the feedback, at least at the time that we got from implementers, uh, is that um, you know they've got all of this optimization for accessing variables on a global object. So that first of all, they wanted to be the implementation creates the global. It's not that you can pass an object in as the global. Um, and, uh, but second of all, they did, they did want it to be, they, you know, they did not like the idea of providing a handler there. So we actually had it in a very early version of the proposal and, and at some point we pulled it out. Right, right. I remember clearly those conversations mostly from Adam, from, from um, V8, um, uh, he didn't want to have any dynamics in the resolution of those bindings, and I feel that uh, mm -hmm. I feel that the proxy uh, added that plus the the exotic aspect of the global object was going to be loose somehow in the proxy thing, and and I and I feel that having the ability to control the initialization of the binding is really key here because if, if what you need is just to find out where do these binding points to or something like that, um, and you do that during the initialization, the first time that you have to resolve that binding, uh, after that, you don't have the dynamics that was the point of contention in the past. Okay. I you think, don't have to I resolve it every time. You resolve it once and you say, oh, this memory points to this other uh, uh, location and then you move on. You never, you never need to get back to resolve that because you already have a binding defined locally in the environment. Okay. What, 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 okay. I want to make sure that we're not confusing two things because I think we might be. Um, the global environment becomes relevant when a module is dereferencing a free variable reference, a, a variable that has a use occurrence but has no defining occurrence in the module. All of this import namespace and live binding and all of that all has to do with um, uh, variables that have a lexical declaration within the module uh, you know, the, where I'm counting a import declaration as a, as a declaration of the variable, because any use occurrence in that scope refers to that declaration. And multiple modules can share the same uh, global, um, but each module clearly has to have its own distinct um, 
uh, top level lexical namespace. And this is reflected in the spec as the distinction between the, um, uh, per, the, the per module lexical environment, per module record lexical environment versus the shared uh, realm record global environment. So uh, I, I, are we talking about both of those? Are we making a distinction between them? Yeah, definitely. They're definitely, they, they, they need different hooks. Yes, this is, this is two. This is definitely uh, on the same page on that. These are two different things. And the, the, the bindings used from the import in the module environment record, those are the ones that I was talking about that you do, you do it once. Because it, it never okay. change after you you link that, and if you okay. link it to something else instead of the original provider, because you want to add a proxy onto it, that should be fine. Um, while the the global one is a a resolution that every time that you encounter that you have to go and find it because it might change. Right. Okay. So. Um... Okay, so good. So let's let's keep them separate. Um, and I think we were um, the um, and I think the the hard problem we were trying to deal with was the uh, top level lexical environment. And we let the global object. Sort of, um, uh, we we should have kept the global object. Uh, let's put, the, put let's put the global object and the global environment aside. Okay. And just just deal with the top level lexical environment with the live bindings between modules. Okay, yeah, that, that sounds right. Okay, okay. Um, okay so if we, if we have such capability, then um, when you are evaluating a module, um, if you have the level of control of saying when the binding is added to this environment record, and the name might be different now, but the module environment record, uh, once the, the, the binding is added there, um, uh, go through this process of resolving that, and this process will be able to allocate something different there. Um, that could be a proxy of the thing that you're importing, and this proxy can add the proper um, membrane mechanism to uh, attenuate whatever you are importing, so you don't need an attenuated, attenuating module in between. You can just simply resolve to that module, evaluate the two separate modules, and the one that is importing from the one that might have issues, you just simply use the hooks to control access to those things and create a separation between the two of them. Okay, so, so uh, so let's just be uh, very concrete. Um, uh, module A is importing live binding variable X from module B. Mm -hmm. um, we want to interpose a membrane between the two so that um, uh, what uh, module A sees is not the current value of X uh, from module B, but a membraned proxy for the current value of X from module B. Uh, and it's got, and it, but it still has to stay alive. So that if module B changes the value of X, then uh, module A sees a, um, still sees a membraned proxy for the new value of X. Yes. Okay. So how to do that? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to have identified that as a goal. That seems like a very, very wonderful goal that's needed for us to identify. And this is, this is independent of whether we're using multiple realms or whether we're all, all in a realm. Uh, we need to be able to impose membranes and being able to impose membranes uh, uh, at the, um, uh, you know, to, to cut um, uh, cut access graphs uh, and being able to pose and inter interpose a membrane within the, the import graph, I think is a, a, a very uh, important thing to have identified. Okay, so that's why I was saying that there are three distinct problems and 
This one is one. The other one okay. is the input maps and how you decide what module you're going to use to fulfill an import statement or a specifier in an import statement. And the second problem is uh, how can we uh, uh, create these module instances, um, which is the, uh, uh, the parsing and evaluation and linkage process of it. I think those okay. are three distinct uh, problems that we need solutions for. And we might have, um, uh, in the case of the import maps, we might have solutions already that give you some of that. Obviously, we want a solution that give you a lot more control over the resolution aspect of it. While the okay. evaluation and parsing, we have nothing, but we are proposing something like the parsing of the uh, of the uh, static module record, and then from there get into the linkage and the evaluation, which we are looking into it. Okay, state the three problems again. The first one is yeah. uh, the resolution process, the input maps. The second one is the uh, parsing and evaluation, uh, parsing linkage and evaluation of a, a module graph. And the third one is the, I'll, I'll call it the micro problem, which is how the specific bindings for a specific import can be controlled. I, don't know. I mean, we don't have to articulate that better, but I, I, just, okay. I feel that the three of them are distinct. They are not, there, there's not much intersection between them. Uh, so that's weird to me because it seems like this seems almost cross cutting to the way that I would divide up the world. Okay, give it the, a shot. Okay. Um, the you you put in category number one import maps and you put in uh category number two you included linkage and evaluation and you included category three uh controlling the bindings of imports uh so those to me are all one category uh it all has to do with when module a imports says it wants to import X from specifier string B, what does it get? And, um, and then the, the other half of number one uh, was resolution. How do you go from a specifier string to uh, a source text out in the wor external world that's reached by some kind of IO? Um, uh, number two, well, you had parsing which is how you go from that source text into a static modular record. Um, uh, so I think that, I think that the, 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 the most important lesson that uh, I've come to over these last six months where all of us have been wrestling with this over these meetings uh, was the lesson that became clear to me from uh, interacting with MetaMask and Embedded uh, but also this comes out with the, you know, the um, Agoric module system that, that um, through the rewrite, which is that there's one set of issues to go from external source text to static module records. And that's, that, that's a, um, uh, that's a conceptually an earlier phase, and in the embedded context, um, is actually often strictly an earlier phase, a build time phase. And then there's um, going from a set of static module records to where each module record is itself completely, uh, 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 completely standalone in the sense that it was it was derived only from the source module text. It was not derived from any intermodule analysis. Uh, and then go, so going from those source text module records to um, an uh, uh, initialized, in, I'm sorry, an instantiated linked 
initialized graph of live module instances. Um, I think that, that keeping that phase separation uh, primary is really, you know, is really, really important. Uh, and it's the only thing that makes it, um, you know, that it's, it's the key step that made it possible to identify what is in common between what we need for general, you know, web use and general server use, et cetera, uh, general bo blockchain use, of course, for us, uh, and what's needed for embedded to have a common set of mechanisms, a common core there that fit with all of us. Uh, it's this, uh, it's the stage separation of those two things that were essential. So resolution and parsing is all in the phase one. Uh, import maps, linkage, evaluation, controlling bindings for imports, that's all in phase two. Um, in, uh, so my meta model here is that when you are when you are about to when you are when you're attempting to evaluate a module um, and you want to apply some sort of control to what this module is going to do with the outside world. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the process of resolving the module specifiers that you import, um, that, that process of determining, oh, this is the, this is the intents. And I'm trying to align my ideas with what you're saying. So if, if I if I I am parsing and uh, evaluating a module, or or let's say I'm not even uh, to be more simple to to have a more simple example, I'm creating a, a, a evaluator and I'm asking that evaluator to go and import something. So I'm giving a a, a, a specifier. Um, the evaluator will go onto, I suspect there will be a hook for the evaluator or compartment in this case to say, okay, you're, you're looking for jQuery and uh, have a way to find out where jQuery source is going to come mm -hmm. from. I'll go and parse that thing for you and I will get it ready to be evaluated in the context of this realm that uh, that the, where the evaluator is on. Um, mm -hmm. So the identity of the things created by this module when evaluated are going to be associated to this realm and such. Uh, and at that point, um, as I parse the module, uh, the, the source of the module, I will be able to go and decide, uh, oh, this jQuery is actually importing uh, jQuery base or jQuery mm -hmm. core something like that, which is a sub-module of that, and and so on. Or maybe just in jQuery is importing Sysl, which is a, a, a query selector library or something like that, which is external and is untrusted. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's mm -hmm. get to that point where we're yeah. talking about untrusted code here. And mm -hmm. and so I'm evaluating the source of jQuery that imports uh, Sysl, and uh, I have identified a way to resolve that but that module might be coming from a, a already existing in-memory instance of that in a different realm, or I wanted to do it in the same realm by uh, finding the source and parsing the source and getting the instance ready for the linkage and such. Either way is fine. Um, but uh, I, up to this point, it's all about finding things that might be already um, name space objects that you have in memory uh, or brand new source that you need to parse and get ready for evaluation. Um, I think that aligns very well with what it is in the API today, in the compartment API today, I believe. Uh, so, the, the, so the compartment API today 
um, uh, the there's the, there's this thing in it that uh, I purposely um, uh, I was purposely ambiguous about a point in my presentation uh, with regard to the import map in what I presented, uh, which is I used the I said the import map uh, in the API is a mapping from child specifier name to either parent specifier name or module namespace object. And by using the mapping notation, the, the, the right arrow, I, uh, I um, did not pin down whether I was talking about a function providing the mapping or I was talking about a data structure providing the mapping. Um, and the, what I have in mind there is that, the, that there's two separate abstractions that are needed to cover the whole, you know, the whole problem, um, which correspond to these two phases, which is what uh, I've been lately calling the loader versus the compartment. And the loader is, um, um, uh, so the loader is something that plugs into, can, can plug into a compartment and can be triggered by looking up um, uh, a name in the mapping. Uh, and, um, uh, and in the case where the loader is triggered, then the loader might go to some external source and load things and parse it into a static module record. Um, but the, uh, the thing about where you plug the loader in is if you plug the loader in into one compartment and then that compartment makes, let's say compartment, uh, you know, R and that compartment makes a compartment S where the compartment S has a, a namespace mapping from S names back to R names, then the loader that's plugged into R will still see the R names, not the S names. So the, the comparison that I made in the talk that was trying to set things up uh, to talk about this explicitly was when I was making the comparison with virtual memory and MMUs. And that uh, MMUs might just map to an existing page, uh, in which case they're just doing mapping, there's no traps involved, uh, or uh, they, they might, um, uh, the virtual address might not correspond to any existing physical page, in which case some other mechanism has to um, uh, uh, be woken up by the trap and go fetch, fetch or create the physical page from somewhere, provide it, and then only once the physical page is provided, uh, can the MMU then um, proceed to map the virtual address to the now existing physical page. So I see the loader as the thing that's basically handling these naming faults, where you're naming something that does not yet correspond to a, um, uh, a module static record that you already have. Uh, and uh, when it brings one in, it does the parsing because the module static record is already post parsing. This is why I'm always going to, you know, um, to s step in when you say parsing and evaluation because they're completely distinct phases. Uh, parsing is isolated and per module. Linkage and evaluation and all that is all between modules. Uh, the other thing that um, is important about the module static record, uh, if we reify it, uh, which so far um, uh, the compartment has not needed to reify it, but the loader might provide a view of the reified one, is being able to say about a module static record to just ask explicitly about the static record, what are the names that it imports and what are the names that it exports? And I think that that's uh, already part of the static module record data structure. And I think it was already part of the API that you showed um, yes. for reifying a module static record. Yeah, so I think yeah, that, yeah. I think, I think for, for purposes of customizing loading, 
it makes perfect sense to expose those names derived from parsing so that an algorithm, a user written algorithm can walk over those names and trigger further faulting based on the, on the names that is, that's provided there, uh, all going from module static record to module static record. But the, the, and the reason for plugging these things together is it says that even though there are these two conceptually separate phases, it doesn't mean that um, that uh, that all modules have to be loaded before any modules get evaluated. They're plugged together in this faulting manner, and they're separated into two, two separate abstractions. Uh, but by doing that, in a typical embedded configuration, there doesn't need to be any runtime loader whatsoever. Uh, so you don't need to, to you know, you, the typical embedded configuration, uh, the thing that's shipped uh, in the device has no ability to, to even parse JavaScript. Um, because if all source text exists up front, uh, you don't need to be able to parse uh, JavaScript in the device, but you still need to be able to create compartments and uh, separate instantiation linkage and all that in order to do um, uh, least authority linkage and separation of authority. Yeah, I, it, because of um, because what we have been talking about is that why I, last last week I was saying that I don't believe that. necessarily that you have to that you have to go ahead, let me see if, if we have the level of control that, that we have been talking about then assuming that you need the attenuated module uh, or mm -hmm. reevaluate a or create a new instance of a of a, of a module, even though you already parse it, um, just to you, for you to guarantee that this new version of the module is not going to uh, uh, have potential side effects that might affect your program uh, uh, mm -hmm. seems a lot less important to me. Um, if, if we get to provide a level of, of control during the evaluation of the body of the module. Um, so that, that sort of so explained why I, I wasn't I wasn't really paying too much attention to uh, the fact that in some cases you still want to have a completely separate version of it. Um, whether that's on the same realm or, or different realm or same compartment or different compartments, I don't think you you will ever you will ever be able to do that in or or it's useful to do that in separate compartments from the same realm. And most likely you just need a completely new version from a completely different realm. Um, I'm not sure about that, but. Um, okay, so, so, so um, it's clear to me that you do, so we need to resolve this. But uh, first of all, once again, uh, the embedded case is clarifying. Um, you're not, you, in order to create a new instance, you can't go back and reparse the source text because you don't no, have no, the source that's text. That's clear. That, you don't that, Mark, that, that, that part is clear for me. You have a, okay. a already parse, a reify okay. uh, object that represent the parse module that contains information about what it imports and what it exports and so on. That one is fine. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, many the, many the modules have. The interesting okay. detail there to, to maybe debate is. Uh, this reified object uh, is tied to a ROM of some sort. Um, no, the module, the module static record you're talking about? The module static yes. record should not yeah. be tied to a ROM. The module static record should be completely ROM independent. Should be completely ROM independent. Well, the reified version of it. The reified version of it will be an object that inherits from an object prototype of some ROM. Right, but the meaning, the, the right, meaning right, that of one. it. I'm, I'm talking about the. I'm talking about the okay. reified version of it. 
Okay, um, so the briefed version will be an object from some realm, but the instance, uh, but the but the process of instantiating it, the the module, the informa the useful information contained in a module static record, has nothing to do with what realm it's reified into. So the ins the, as when you make module instances of it, those instances could be instances in a completely unrelated realm. Right, that's the that's the area that I want to get to. Okay. You, you get these objects and now you have to somehow sign out that you're going to uh, create a new instance of this yeah. and you're going to create it in a realm. Yeah. And, and, and that process of deciding that um, it's a, it's, it's a very interesting um, process because I, I suspect I was on the assumption that, well, if you have this reified object that belongs to a realm, uh, you can just simply assume that the reified object uh, carries certain information um, about the realm that once you create an instance out of that static record, it, it might carry the same identity that the realm associated to this uh, reified object. Um, but if, if, if possible, it might be interesting to explore the ability to do it in a completely different realm. I haven't think about that kind of API. Uh, that kind of API doesn't exist in, in the language today because um, we don't have many things about uh, the separate realms and such, but it will be interesting. I, I was on the assumption that just the uh, identity of the of the reified object is sufficient to say instances uh, associated to this static record belong to that realm. So in the embedded scenario, um, the issue doesn't come up because there's only one realm. One realm. But you yeah. still, but but you still have to be able to take the same module static record and multiply instantiate it to instantiate it in different compartments. So, for example. Uh, if the module instance represents a communications channel among those who import it, you can create isolation by uh, separately instantiating it in separate isolated subgraphs by, you know, represented by distinct compartments with, with isolated import graphs. So right. um, I, I was on the assumption that um, not in the case, in the case of embed, but in the, in the case of a, a scenario where you need multiple realms. Um, once you're trying to uh, evaluate a module and you parse it and you find out the dependencies of it, and there is one of these dependencies that should be evaluated in a different realm for whatever reason, or, um, you will be able to find a realm, create or, or parse the, the source with the parser that you have in that realm and get the uh, the static uh, module record uh, reified object uh, and use it in uh, as a as a fulfillment for the dependencies. Or create an instance out of it that fulfills the dependencies that I'm looking for, and that process automatically uh, allows to say when this module associated to this static. A record that belongs to a different realm uh, needs to be evaluated. We know the evaluation should happen in this other realm without having to really create a, a more complicated API that allow you to associate the instance of a static um, module record with a realm. Don't assume the API that I'm talking about is more complicated. I think it's simpler. Um, uh, the um, the once you and and just to add to that, and that's probably why last week I was talking about um sorry um. Um, that's why last week I was talking about 
parsing and the instantiation process almost as the same thing or it, it, it not necessarily a distinct thing because I was on the assumption that when you parse, you're parsing with a particular API that belongs to a ROM and that carries certain weight into the process um, that the intents of this thing that you're parsing will come out of that ROM. So the, the module static record um, really conceptually could be just pure data, right? I mean, if, if we, um, uh, I'm gonna, good. I mean, we don't have, a, you know, a rich enough set of, you know, of value types, um, but there's nothing about it semantically that conveys anything other, you know, there's nothing about it that is realm specific. And in fact, if you're in a multiple realm environment, then you don't want to even pay the overhead of parsing it multiple times because the parsing of it is completely context independent. It's just according to the specification of the programming language. So if the realms are running the same programming language, you'd like to just parse it once. Um, right, right. And, and, and I think uh, that touches on another edge that, that we touched last week, which was the, the I, again, I'm, I'm, I have a bunch of assumptions trying to communicate then. Um, the assumption in this case, or my assumption in this case, was that in order for different people with different capabilities be able to depend on a particular module that is non-trusted, let's say. Okay. Uh, uh, and you have different importers that has probably different capabilities or different ways of protecting themselves uh, mm -hmm. from this untrusted module. Uh, the, my assumption was that we could have a single instance of that module to be shared. Um, no, but you, you can't because it's a communications channel. Modules are stateful. <laughs> hear me out. <laughs> hear me okay. out. Uh, the the fact that you can place a membrane between the these different modules that import the untrusted module uh, give you a lot more control of what these untrusted module can do. Um, and in the case of membranes, for example, there is some some uh, level of uh, some semantics that you can add to the membrane. With, whether or not the objects that these membranes are seen are uh, frozen or not. That's an example of it. But the fact that uh, uh, I was uh, assuming that it is possible to share that intent if you have the membrane in between, rather than be forced to create new versions of that untrusted for each individual importer that needs a version of it or needs an intent of it. Okay. And, and I think let's, you were, let's, you were let's take that. a concrete example. Let's mm -hmm. take a concrete example from Modable. Let's have a module that simply exports a function named Inker, and it has internally a, uh, a, a top level variable that it does not export uh, called count. And what Inker does is it just says, it's just a function that says return plus plus count. Now, uh, I want to, let's say I want to set up a situation where uh, uh, Alice and Bob are two modules in, uh, in one isolation unit. So they should, so I want them to share um, uh, the, the count so that, it, so that they both see the count as incremented by either of them. And I want Carol and Dave to be in a separate uh, isolation unit where they're using the same module static record, but they've got a separate instance of it so that they share, uh, so that they see a count that's according to um, uh, their shared count, that the count increments as either of them increment it, but, Al but the Alice Bob counting doesn't influence the Carol Dave counting and vice versa. I don't see any way to do that with the membrane. Okay. Um, 
Um, I'm, I'm, I'm typing a little bit here. Um, uh, but but uh, so to before I, I, I get to type the, the whole thing, uh, the the important uh, important thing to notice here is that uh, yes, sometimes you do want to do that. Uh, you don't want to have the side channels associated to sharing the same. Uh, the same uh, instance of that module with multiple importers. Uh, but the flip side of it is that sometimes you do want that level of uh, sharing. Sure. Even though, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the APIs that we, that we need to provide should support both of them. Yes, good, good, we're agreed. Okay. Uh, and so the example that you were saying, you, you, you're saying you, you have uh, Carol, and what else Carol, was it? Car Carol and Dave are two module instances that should both see a shared count. They should both see um, the, the count value that they're seeing is the count value as incremented by either of them. And likewise, uh, Alice and Bob are two different module instances um, that are isolated from Carol and Dave, uh, but they're using the, their, their, they've imported what is the same module static record, it was conceptually the same static module, but they're getting a different instance of it so that they see uh, a shared count according to how either of them have incremented it. Okay, so, so, the so let, me, let me see if I can, I can get the uh, full picture here. So let's say that A is a bucket and you have two modules in there, Carl and Dave. And you're saying okay. those two share the same. And then you have another bucket, uh, B, that contains, you say, what were what, what the other two? Al Alice and Bob. Alice and Bob, okay. And those, they have, um, okay. And they, and they and they are using a counter. Yes, the, the entire the, the shared module consists entire I can I can the, the entire contents of the shared module is let count equal zero. Uh, and then in here you have a let, and then uh, uh, export function inker open close open curly uh, plus return plus plus count. Semicolon close curl. I did. That's it. That's the that's that's the module that Alice and Bob want to share. That's the module that uh, Dave and Carol want to share. Yep. Okay. So. Um, and I want to only that person. You, want, you, you, you just to clarify, you're saying that um, the modules in bucket A should share the same increment. Uh, so if one of them increments and the other one read it, she'll see it. While yes. uh, this other bucket here does not want that. They want a completely separate uh, counter uh, version of it. Right. Okay, yep. Good. Yep, okay, yeah. So uh, I feel that we're, we're on the same page in here. And, uh, Great. and th there, there, there is also the case where you do want the counter to be shared between all of them, yes. but you don't, you don't want um, you don't want to um, uh, have them in the same same scope. So if if, if in here um, I try to do, let's say that here I'm importing uh, increment increment uh, from um, Oh, oh. Counter. Didn't, real, didn't, didn't realize there was something on the screen. Hold on. Let me bring oh, oh, yeah, I was typing. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so if, I, if I'm doing something like this, um, and um, and Dave is 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 uh, trying to um, also do the same thing. Let, let's say they just say console log of of. Of, of increment because the issue is what 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 do they see as the return count? Yeah. And uh, we do the console log in here as well. 
and then we do the same thing in these two fellows. Right. Yep. Okay. Um, and then yeah. you go and run that thing. Uh, let me see where I can run that. Uh, the app here running somewhere. I'll be able to import. I'll be able to import um, uh, a caro. A Dave, um, A uh, B Alice, and uh, Alice uh, and Bob here from B. Something like okay. This. Okay. Uh, let me do that. Uh, the console log who this is. This is Carol. Good. my fingers here. Okay. Um, uh, oh, it's not a default export. Let me make it a default export. Oh, the other thing, when I was talking about the two phases and the importance of separating them, uh, the other um, uh, thing that are, you know, besides embedded and uh, um, uh, the other place where this comes up in a big way is CSP when when evaluation is suppressed. CSP when evaluation is suppressed. Yeah. Now the constraints there are somewhat different, um, but it's it's interesting how much the CSP environment and the embedded environment push in the same direction. I didn't get the relationship between uh, between these two things. Can so, you... for example, in your in your evaluator uh, API that you had presented uh, last time, uh, you had a operation for going from uh, module source text uh, to a um, you know to a module something. I'm not sure a module static record, a module instance, or whether mm -hmm. you're distinguishing, but but you were, you, you were able to go from source text to something that you could evaluate. And oh, I see, I see, I see that by, by calling parse. Right. Yeah, okay, um, got it. So, right, so uh, in, a, in a CSP environment where all evaluation is suppressed, uh, it's similar to, but still different, than an embedded environment where there's simply no ability to parse in the shipping device. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine with that, yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, so the, 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 the added example here is, uh, is to try to assess what these, um, what level of protection, so in, in our case today, um, if I do something like this, where, let me see which one is the first one to be evaluated in the order. Carol is the first one. Let me do it in Carol. Okay, okay. So if I do the expando on Carol, I mean, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm right. trying to use a, a side channel here to, yes. to simply use that thing to add things and be able to share with everyone else who has access to the increment. That's right. Um, and so if I run this thing again, I should be able to see that uh, the expando does work on uh, on Carol and Dave, but do, do not work on Alice and Bob because they are in a different bucket. Yes. Uh, and this is what the membranes protection provides on top of this. Uh, where... Okay, but, but so I understand about the expandos because those are on the surface. What about the count? The count is going to, yeah, because it's part of the logic of the module, yes. In that case, you have to Say, well, I want a different version of these. Right. I have the parse version in the the the, the okay. static uh, module record, um, 
go and reuse that in a new realm or in the same realm um, somehow. I still fussy, I'm still fussy about the same realm of the same module, but I feel that uh, that will be a little bit tricky. Um, because this module, the content module might have other dependencies. And what happened with those dependencies? The, uh, in setting up the, uh, the import namespace environment, uh, if you want isolation, you have to make sure that the- You that, have to resolve uh, those two, right? You have to go and yeah, create those, right. those two and create it and, and you reuse the static for those and build yep. a new module grab. That's right. So in that case, yes, it's fine to do it in the same, in the same realm. You have to build the entire thing again, but in the yep. same realm, it works fine. Okay. Yeah, and it's only building the, the, you know, because they're sharing the module static records, the typical memory overhead of rebuilding. Yeah, it's just uh, the environment, you know, the environment records for that, for each of the modules and, and that's it, and evaluating that. Right. Okay, yep. Um, and and, okay. and modable, I should emphasize, mo the, the, the inker separation that I'm showing here, this is actually just a simplification of a demonstration that Modable already has. So Modable has this working. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so uh, this is sort of uh, an example of, of what we have right now where each of the buckets, buckets are top level folders on source here. Um, each of these buckets, they have a, a, a different global. Uh, they have a membrane in between them that controls what they're trying to do with respect to the things that they are importing. And, um, and this membrane has the ability to define distortions between um, the application and what these different buckets of code will, will see. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, obviously it's going through transpilation. Uh, so this thing will, will get transpiled into something that uh, preserve the module semantics in terms of the import and what it export, but the body of it that has side effects will go and be sandboxed by controlling the access to the bindings that they need and uh, the globals that they need. It, um, so that's sort of a, the mechanism that we use. Okay, so let me, let me just make sure that we're also, it sounds like there's there's a whole lot we're in agreement on. Uh, we, uh, you've been focusing on the membrane interposition between modules uh, that I have not been, uh, and we both agree that we need to support that. I've been focusing on the multiple instantiation and you have not, but we both agree we both need to support that. Um, we've been implementing a shim using the eight magic lines of code. You've been implementing a shim using translation, but we both agree that what we need to specify is something that provides these properties uh, without the user, without, you know, without either translation or with statements, that, that, that the thing that we're shimming through translation or with statements, the thing that we're shimming is something that we want to propose for use without translation and without with statements. Yeah, I think we agree on that. One side note is that the reason why we do not uh, focus on until now, or, or, or we haven't really have the need to focus on the uh, multiple um, instantiations of counter is because you can achieve the same today um, multiple ways by providing a import maps that result to a different module and uh, let the server who provides the, the, who serve the file give you the same file which will require reparsing and such but you could achieve that today it's not it's, uh, uh, the overhead is there but it's achievable mm -hmm. um, and uh, while the the other aspect of it, the the control of uh, what what the module is doing during evaluation is a little bit more tricky and 
requires either the width or the or the transpiration. Okay, good. It is a lot heavier as well. Good. All right. And um, so what's the next uh, step? Okay, so first of all, let me let me check whether we're also agreeing on a conclusion that I'm drawing from this conversation, which is the um, the separation of uh, loader versus compartment as representing these two phases, not that they're chronological phases, they can be, one can trigger the other, but still they're two conceptually separate phases, uh, that that separation has survived to my mind this entire discussion. It's still a great separation and it's one that we should be able to agree on. I, I feel that I have uh, gaps on what you mean by loader. Uh, is loader it... is the thing that goes from uh, a demand for a name uh, uh, into uh, a a module static record and uh, possible, in fact, likely uh, the coexistence of other related module static records um, uh, according to, uh, you know, given that the user can look at the module static record, figure out what names it imports and then go through a name, uh, you know, as part of the loading behavior, you know, go, going through some algorithm that the user provides for which will obviously provide some defaults. Um, uh, so that they can go from external source text reachable through some IO means uh, into a set of loaded module static records associated with specifier names such that that mapping can be provided to the compartment API to satisfy the compartment APIs um, uh, demand for module static records corresponding to names. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, so yes, I think, uh, uh, I, I, I will try to not call that loader. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with whatever name you want to give to it. No, because a loader already has a lot of implications and a lot of baggage on it. Yeah, and, okay, uh, I, I, I agree with that. It's um, more like uh, a, what, this is This is really the API that, that um, Dave was referencing as the module reflection API, which allow you to... Okay. Um, because it, at some point, this API might also uh, allow you to simply create uh, an artificial module of some sort, a synthetic yes. module of some sort. That's right, and, that's right. The, and the, so the, it's just, it's just uh, trying to give you the power to do the same that normally the browser would do for you. And, yes. And, and he called it module reflection API. Okay, uh, can we have a shorter name? <laughs> <laughs> Module reflection. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um. Okay. I'll, I'll um, just go with module reflection until we come up with something better. But I, yeah. I, I agree with you. We should avoid the term loader. It's too confusing. Yeah. Because it really the loader you're doing it in user land mode. You're the one in control. You're go, you're going to do the fetch. You're going to do the parse by calling an API to parse, and you're going to do something with that thing. Um, so you're not really. Uh, you're not really um, providing an API that magically goes and do the I/O. You're just telling the user, "Go and do the thing that you need, whether that's I/O or not, and give me the things that I need in order to carry on." Okay, good. Um, uh, the last thing on that is that I, uh, in my mind, when I was thinking about this API this last week, I was thinking in terms of uh, I already have the static module record object, uh, and I'm now ready to uh, to get the module evaluated um, as part of the 
uh, evaluation process that I'm carrying on right now. Uh, and I want to determine, uh, let me, let me step for a step back for a second. When it comes to, I have a, um, I don't know how to call this in English, but I do have an issue with um, a gap with the fact that when we have these conversations, I have a hard time uh, understanding or, or signaling who is in control of the evaluation process. And specifically, in many cases, we're talking, when, when I'm talking about a module, I'm talking about the importer, the module that is importing other modules. I mean, the process of getting that to be ready for evaluation. Yeah, um, it is, the, the importer is not in control. Right, the, 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 the compartments hooks is really what give you the control, right? Right, right. So, um, the, so the control is in the hands of whoever creates the compartment. Right. Um, so, so you, I, the, and, th and that's part of a general pattern is the controlling code is conceptually outside the controlled code. You never control yourself. You always create. You you always control an environment that you create. Okay, so let's keep going on that on that because I I, I sometimes lose track of certain things along the way. So when when we're talking about uh, evaluating a module, um, and we have the level of control at the evaluator compartment level. Um, that module, if we're going to have a API that that solve the problem that we have been talking today, the initial problem um, of controlling the, the bindings for that module. Um, when it comes to evaluating the code, you need to provide the proper hooks for that module to resolve the things that this module needs. Um, okay. I suspect it will be a generic hook that works for every module that this ROM is evaluating um or uh, that this compartment is controlling or evaluating or th th thank you for saying compartment before i had to jump in and say <laughs> okay so we have a compartment that has the hooks any module that this compartment has to go and um uh, evaluate which is yeah. part of the process of uh going through the module graph and evaluating all the missing pieces because there might be some of them that are already evaluated in another compartment or in another realm. I get that part. Mm -hmm. So it's only yep. the things that we're going to evaluate because those are the things that we really want to have the level of control there. Um, I, I often struggle with the concept of uh, when this compartment is going to evaluate that or the code, um, how we'll have a hook that will uh, have enough information passed to the hook that allows to make decisions about what what kind of membranes and what kind of protection we're going to give to that particular module that is being evaluated. And I, I sort of get that, but it, it, once it comes to multi, multi realms where you have uh, multiple evaluators in, in the two different realms, so two evaluators in two different realms, and and you're sort of sharing some pieces of it. Uh, who is in control of the evaluation of the module? The fact that evaluator in bucket A is uh, using a reference to a, a, a static module uh, record from bucket B, that we're going to create an instance of it in bucket B uh, once we need it, and we define that linkage, but is bucket A the one going through the module graph and evaluating the pieces of it? When it gets to that module that is coming from bucket B, who is in control? Is it the evaluator in bucket B or is it the evaluator okay. in bucket A? Okay, so, here, so um, uh, I'll talk through what I have in mind uh, uh, with regard to 
compartments within a realm, and I believe everything I'm going to say should apply across realms. So let me try it out. I have not tried this before. Um, so uh, the idea is that um, if you have linked together compartments, it can be even the you know the compartments uh, A and B that we were just talking about with. Yeah, it could be two instead of two realms, could be a, a realm that has two compartments and they have different level of control. Right. So the so the the clearest situation is there's yet another compartment that set up the relationship between A and B. And I think that works even if A and B are across realms, because if they're across realms, there still needs to be some code that knew about both realms in order to set up a relationship. Mm -hmm. So let's call that the start compartment. Mm -hmm. So the start compartment is in the same realm, let's say, as compartment A. And the start compartment, so the start compartment creates compartment A in its own realm. And maybe the start compartment uses the realm API to create a separate realm and then uses the compartment API of that separate realm to create compartment B. Mm -hmm. uh, and now it causes a module to get loaded into compartment B and it gets the module namespace object from the loaded module instance. Um, and then it create then going back then so it does that first let's say and then when it creates it, it, module it, Mark can you repeat that last piece again Yes uh, so the start compartment first creates a realm for compartment B then it creates within that realm it creates compartment B mm -hmm. using that realm's compartment constructor Yeah um, and then it, however, it, it does it, it loads, a, it causes a module instance to be instantiated in compartment B. Mm -hmm. uh, so that module instance is clearly of that other realm. Mm -hmm. uh, but its namespace object is a genuine mod module namespace object. I'm going to ignore for a moment all the desires we have that we agree on for, me for membraning these things. I'm just going to do raw yeah, access. Yeah. Um, so then what it does is when it creates, uh, so, so the start compartment now has a hold of that namespace object. Now mm -hmm. the start compartment creates compartment A in its own realm and it provides in the module map for compartment A, a mapping from the specifier string foo to the module namespace object it had obtained from compartment B. Mm -hmm. So now when something in compartment A imports the specifier foo, it actually gets the module instance from the other realm. Mm -hmm. So does that answer the question? Mm, no, uh, up to this point, everything is clear. Um, okay. The, my problem was if I want to control, I know you're not talking about the membranes, but that's where things get a little bit more tricky for me because in order for, okay. uh, for, for uh, the module in compartment A to create a binding to something from compartment B, um, uh, it must, so in, in, in your example there, first let me solve this other problem or try to understand this other problem. It's, so you're saying somehow you get the uh, module in compartment B to be evaluated, which is uh, on itself a little bit weird, um, especially when you have circular dependencies and such, I, you might, yeah, so, you, yeah. My, my stories, let me acknowledge, my story is weak on circular dependencies. The, 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 I, I was always on the assumption that the, the map that you're creating doesn't require modules to be instantiated. They need modules to be a thing, a, an instance of a static 
of a module record, but they don't necessarily need to be instantiated because the instantiation is something that will be carried on by the, the process of evaluating a module graph from the top. Okay, so um, uh, uh, yes and no. Um, the, this, this was the thing that took me so long to understand. Um, uh, is so hopefully that, it doesn't take me that long if you explain to me. <laughs> no, yeah, it was, just, it was a terminology issue. And the reason, I'll say, it's a tremendous amount of these terminology issues. The thing that took me months longer to understand what Modable was doing than it should have is the fact that the spec uses just the abstraction of module record, both for the static information and for the instance. And it just made it impossible to separate concepts. Um, so, uh, so in the Modable system, uh, um, the, uh, if you provide a name to name mapping uh, in the compartment API, when you're creating a new compartment, then you're, then everything that gets instantiated gets instantiated in the new compartment. There's no cross compartment linkage of instances if you only provide name to name mappings. Uh, because the name is only looking up, when you provide a name to name mapping, the only things you're looking up from the name are um, module static records. And uh, then that module static record will be freshly instantiated uh, in the new compartment, independent of whether it has been instantiated in other compartments. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want not to separately instantiate it, but you want to do a cross compartment linkage, then you provide the module namespace object. And the reason we provide the module namespace object is because what you're really talking about is the module instance. And, um, but we don't reify, the module instance is not a reified concept, but module namespace objects are exactly one-to-one -one with module instances. Um, and the, the um, and when I say that, I mean, uh, after things have settled down, after a module graph has been, um, has been in, you know, uh, instantiated and initialized, they're one-to-one. -one. I, don't, I don't know actually at what point during the initialization, the module namespace objects come to exist. Um, and depending on what the answer to that is, uh, this might just not be an adequate story for cycles. Right, um, uh, yeah, so the, the module namespace object is not needed at all during the evaluation of the module. The, the module namespace, you can always, given knowledge, if you want for a given, for a given module instance that you can name, you can always get the module namespace object by doing a, um, a import star as. Right, so but, you that, can, but only so when you do that, the namespace is going to be. Right, right, but the idea is that the start compartment can, can obtain these module namespace objects and then the start compartment can use that to talk about module instances. Now this is indirect. Uh, the other more direct option that would be more cycle friendly is to introduce into the API an explicit reification of a module instance. The only reason we were using module namespace objects is to avoid that reification. Yeah, and I, I, and I, and, and I think that's, so I think you nail it there, at least for me, because that's where I believe uh, I, I see two options. If, 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 we, if, we, if we have the ability to, um, let, me, let me step back for a second. Okay, so if I have a hook that tells me, I'm, I'm specifically now talking about the, the membrane approach. Um, mm -hmm. If I have a hook that allow me to decide the resolution of a binding um, during the evaluation of a module, I need mm -hmm. to know what this module is about. Um, I might have provide only the, the static module record as uh, part of the map, and therefore, when the incomes comes up, I will not be able to tie that back to the, the module record. 
um, um, because it's the internals doing the process of this is a static model record. I need to create an instance of it and I need to uh, give it back to you because I'm about to evaluate the code there and you need to resolve binding pool. So the mapping there for me was lost in the C. Like, how can I know what to do? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, that's why I was asking what kind of API can we have that allow okay. me to identify the module uh, yeah. in such a way that I can have a generic uh, hook that I will be able to provide the right membrane implementation. That's okay. option number one. We could try to solve that problem. Option number two is ignore the, 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 the hook as the at, at the component at, at the compartment level and at the hook at these uh reify new um object that represent a, a a module intense that hasn't been evaluated yet and so just like you do parsing by having mm -hmm. a source and you do the parsing on it you could also do the same by saying i have this parse uh, static module record. I want to create a thing out of it and I want to provide the hooks that I want. So when this thing is evaluated, I can do the resolutions of the pieces for that thing. I already know who that, who that mm -hmm. is because it's created off the module record. And I feel that mm -hmm. that one is a little bit more, more flexible for me because then uh, in a module graph, you will be creating these things uh, and you will be able to control what each of these things are going to do in terms of IO. So that all sounds plausible to me. Uh, I think we should go through that exercise. Uh, the idea of taking these internal abstractions and turning them into reified abstractions with exposed APIs, uh, I find that attractive. Um, uh, and then the, the, um, the simple pattern exposed through the existing compartment API could just be a convenience on top of that. Um, but then the the compartment API as a convenience doesn't need to by itself be fully expressive. Uh, if you've got something lower level that we're exposing that's fully expressive. Uh, I would still make obviously a, a, a absolute distinction between the reified module static record and its API and the reified module instance and its API. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, sounds good. Sounds good. I can I can um, attempt to put something together for maybe next week. Um, uh, That'd be great. And we we can we can go over it next week on, on this. Okay. One. I think actually I'm gonna check my calendar. I think next week. Um, let me check my calendar. Yeah, where is next week or the following? It's fine. Yeah, next, uh, no, next week is fine. I was thinking okay. of um, TC53 is going to be meeting uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, uh, which obviously we'll be discussing a lot of this then as well. I'll be uh, giving again an extended form of the talk that I gave at TC39. Uh, I'll be giving that at TC53. Okay. Very good. Okay, see you next week. All right, bye. Okay, bye. See ya. Okay. That's it. Yeah, see you guys next week.